I feel very strongly that there's a need to disrupt science and it's because it's become comfortable and it's become complacent and it's become in many ways highly compartmentalized. If you look back to the times of the Medicis for example, the real uh, era of enlightenment, what happened there was the Medicis had, had more money than, than anybody and it meant that they could afford to bring people in from every discipline scientists, philosophers, astronomers, artists, sculptors, the whole lot, bring them all into one area. And the creativity that resulted from these polymaths interacting with other polymaths was so inspirational that it stays with us all this time afterwards. You still have the effects of it. And then what we've done since that time, I think, is we've got narrower and narrower and narrower again. And so we're, we're looking at things blinkered and slightly myopic. And it's almost as if we're afraid to take the blinkers off and see what happens. And we had a, a, a postdoc student um, that we brought into our Leverhulme grant. And she said at one point, she said, I think I might have made the biggest mistake of my career because I took myself out of my area to come into this wide open space and I don't know where my career is going to go. And we've become a scientist. We're only successful if we have grants. We're only successful if we write papers. We're only successful if we can innovate into commercialization that makes money. So we've become very, very focused in specific avenues that we have to go down. And if we don't fulfill those, so if, if as an academic you don't get the grants and you don't write the papers, then they will take you out of research, a lot of universities, and say, right, you're going to become a teacher. And that's great because you're involved in teaching the students, but you're also not allowing the creative side of your mind to, to be exposed to the research era. And so that expectation of scientists and how they should perform and what is an acceptable output and what we need to do for the research excellence framework and the teaching excellence framework and the knowledge exchange framework and every kind of F that you can think of, TEF, KEF and REF, then what that does is it stifles that ability that we have to take the shackles off, to relax into what's the problem that we want to address. Who do we need to bring into the room to help us address it? Let's not worry about whose intellectual property it is. Let's not worry about who's going to get the patent off it. Let's just solve the problem. <clears throat> and I do think that that disruption <clears throat> or the lack of disruption is what has corralled us into not being able to solve particularly well some of our grand challenges, our big problems for our planet and for our society because we're looking at it through different lenses and we're not bringing the lenses together. So disruption, I think, is where if we can be brave enough, if we can be bold enough, and if our funders, because we do need funds to do it, let's be perfectly honest, if our funders can give us that level of freedom, then I think what we can achieve would be the next renaissance. It would be the next time of enlightenment. <coughs> it's the point at which the planet would move forward. But it requires the funding and it requires the mindset and it requires us to say to universities or our employers, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to be conventional about it. I need to be unconventional. Do we think that the people who set up Microsoft or set up Google were conventional? They may have become conventional, but at the outset, when that, that big idea was there, they were breaking new ground and they were being disruptive. And it's the disruption that's important. So if you look at things like the mobile phones, <coughs> all you end up with is another model that does something slightly different and another model that does something slightly different and another model that does something slightly different. So with every stage, the step between a stage gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And what you need is game change. So you need something that completely disrupts that step by step movement. And then eventually it will get into its own step-by-step -step movement. But we need those massive disruptions. And, and we've seen it in terms of our, our computing capabilities over the last few years. You know, when I was a child, <coughs> music came out of the radio. Excuse me. <coughs> 
when I was a child, music came out of the radio, which you had to warm up, the television, which you had to warm up, computers didn't exist, um, and then Walkmans came in, so you could actually carry music with you. And you can see all of these developments to the point now where, by and large, television, the thing that, that really captivated its children, is now no longer used the same way. Computers are no longer used the same way. Images we can take with us and they're live, whereas before you had to take them and you take them into the chemist to be able to develop them. You can see throughout our life these step changes, but if you look at those as a whole, that whole digital disruptive era was a massive, massive step change. And if you look at where those occur, they occur either because you bring, you've got the foresight to bring incredibly mad, absolutely mad, brilliant people together who would not normally be together into a room and you fund them and you don't let them out until they've come up with good ideas. Or it's necessity. And necessity is the one that really does breed innovation. We need to change this because we can't go on. What do we do? Is our renewable energy going to be one of those disruptive things? God, I'd really like to think so, given how much wind we have in Scotland and rain we have in Scotland. You know, we're not so much sun, but at the moment it's okay. Those kinds of innovations that saying we can't keep burning coal, we can't keep burning these fossil fuels, those innovations are just brilliant. And then of course on comes fracking. You think, well, you know, is that an extension of being able to find an energy source? But is it an area that we want to go into? These these all they all develop new ideas. And just because we can do them doesn't mean we should do them. And there is a, a moral and an ethical obligation every time you have a step change to say what is the right thing to do and what is not. And we need that societal responsibility. And that comes within our own consciences, but it also comes down to our legal system. So our legal system has to be able to keep up with and manage the massive developments that go on in our science. So when you think about the legal system, do you know, it doesn't change very quickly and it certainly doesn't change very far. Um, it's, it's micro stages at a time. I think in some ways we're, we're outstripping um, what has been our, our policing in the past, which is our investigative forces and our judges and our courtrooms. And I think we're having to get to a position where we police ourselves, where we have a moral and a legal responsibility that as each and every individual we have to stand up to and own. Is this the right thing to do? Because I can do it, should I be doing it? Um, I am very fortunate uh, to have been in the science world and I have had uh, a little peek every now and again into the legal world, uh, usually because my cases come into the legal world and I end up as being an expert witness in court, which is rarely a comfortable position for a scientist to be. And I have a youngest daughter who's just going into her fourth year in law. And so I'm, I'm seeing things from, from her perspective as well. There are very different worlds, very, very different worlds. The science world wants to explore. It wants to expand boundaries. It wants to blow boundaries. It wants to shoot off in different directions. It wants to be creative. It wants to have a free spirit. The legal profession is bound by laws and rules. And so it's incredibly frustrated in terms of being able to cope with this massive thing that keeps changing. So when you look at our, our biggest expansion over the last few years, which has got to be into the digital world, whether it's within computing or, or, or digital aspects, or, or even into the molecular world, for example, with DNA, these are fast moving fields and our laws are just not able to keep up with those. But not only our laws, our investigative authorities are struggling as well. When you speak to the police, they say, you know, they just can't police the mountain of digital image that comes in on every single crime. If you go back to the 1970s and you have a murder, then in that murder, what you've got is the crime scene. That That's pretty much it. Today's crime scene has got mobile phones, it's got computers, it's got CCTV cameras, it's got smart bits of equipment with Bluetooth, it's got your fridge that can tell you the last time the door was opened, um, it has got your hot tub that can tell you the last time that you actually put any water into it. All of these things are now sources of information 
and the millions of emails and Snapchats and images and such things that go out from phones every single hour means that for investigative authorities now, they are just bogged down and they need, they need the assistance to keep up with science. And if the police can't keep up with science, the courts are not going to keep up with science. But the courts I've always felt, and I think really unfairly, have always felt that the courts are not interested in new technology. They most certainly are. All the judges we've talked to are really interested in new technology. All they say is make sure it's accurate, make sure it's verifiable, make sure you can explain it in the courtroom, and then absolutely we'll let it in. But they're, they're really drowning under the volume of digital information that has to be trawled every single time there's a crime. So, so we're aware that our science is moving and keeping the police with us is challenging, but keeping the courts and the judiciary with us is even more challenging. And that means that the relationship needs to be worked on. We need to be able to explain what we're doing to the judges and to the lawyers and to the police officers. And it's important that the science is not led by the police or not led by the courts. It's important that science is led by the scientists, but that we're able to inform and educate those who need to interact with it. It's a really tall order at the moment. Part of our, our problem in the courtroom is that our juries believe that they're forensically aware because they watch CSI and they watch Silent Witness and they watch all of these programs. So they think they know what DNA is and, and what DNA results say and what blood toxicology says and blood spatter patterns, if they watch Dexter, whatever it may be. They think they're experts. And when you speak to the judges and, and the barristers, what they say is, you know, juries, and, and to be honest, most trials are really dull. Um, juries are pretty much, you know, bored rigid until they hear, oh, there's a forensic scientist coming in. And they apparently do physically pick up when there's a forensic scientist in the room. And then very quickly they realise that we need to talk about probability and we need to talk about statistics and we need to talk about physics and we need to talk about chemistry and biology. And you see these really eager faces, you see it on the jury when you come in and you can see their faces start to melt when you start to talk about p-values and you start to talk about Bayes' theorem and, you know, past probability and prior probability and you can see them go, oh, you know, no, and I'm not interested. So it's, it's really difficult to find that balance between giving them the information that you believe to be correct, and of course you may be wrong, but it's your opinion. As an expert witness, you're permitted to have an opinion. Um, getting that across without biasing them and giving them enough information to understand, but also not overloading them with terms that they can never hope to understand in the time scale that's available to them. Now we could go out and we can, try and gen we can try to educate the entire population in science because that's what we'd have to do because we've got no control over who's selected on a jury. And the question then becomes, well, is the jury system flawed? But the jury system is what we've used since the Magna Carta in this country, that you have a right to trial by your peers. And although there are some parts in the court, particularly in the civil courts, where we don't have juries anymore, and the family courts, I can't see it coming into our criminal system anytime soon. But it's not only the, the, the public that you have to educate. You need to educate the lawyers and you need to educate the judges. And so in many ways, if you can't, if it's such a large workforce in terms of educating the public, then it's a much smaller workforce to educate the legal system. And so science, I think, is a very strong role to play in law degrees and in judicial colleges, ensuring that our judges and our criminal lawyers in particular are as up to speed with modern technology and modern science as they possibly can be, because they're the ones who are going to have to ask the questions in court. If they don't understand that probability, then how can they know what the next question is? And you find yourself sometimes, you see it in court, the expert witness is getting so tangled up in an argument that just can't be won, that you're willing the judge to say, stop, can we go back to basics here? Because nobody quite understands. And often the judge won't do that either. So sometimes we see our court cases just descending into a mire of non-directional scientific babble. 
Um, and that may be to one side or the other's benefit, of course, because we have to remember that we've got an adversarial system. Maybe in those areas where we have an inquisitorial system, as we have in some parts of Europe, then perhaps we take away some of that focus that is placed on the expert witness. But what we don't have in this country, which is really good, is we don't have the situation that they have in North America. You can't pay the expert. You're not paying the hired gun. The fees that you get for going into court are never ever going to encourage anybody to be an expert witness for the sake of financial return. And I think that's a very good thing. I'd love to think that, that what we could do in science is to counteract all the, all the fake news and all the, all the stuff that's out there that is myth. But we have to be realistic about it. When we look, if we look at the jury, and the jury represents the public, then by and large you will find that on a jury they've probably not had any great interest in science since they were about 14, when they made their choice in school as to what they are going to do. And their science innovation and their science immersion probably stops there. It's important that they try to understand that there is good science and that that good science can make a difference. But when you're not in the field, sometimes it's easier to believe the bad science. It's easier to believe the myth. It's easier to believe what's out there in, in red top media because it sells a story, because it goes to a public level of, of understanding that, that they can cope with and that they're comfortable with. Whereas, and the scientist therefore has got quite a battle on their hands. So for example, um, when the individuals were being identified from the London bombing, and there was a lot of material that could not be identified just simply because it was fragmented. And the police uh, commander at the time said, I'm going to have to speak to the families because we've got human remains that we can't identify. We simply can't because they're tiny little fragments and because there's so much contamination then occurs when you have fragmentation, when you have body parts that come into contact with each other. You don't know whose DNA is whose because you transfer the DNA from one to the other. And he was having to explain why they couldn't identify every single bit to families. And he did an incredible job. Um, and then he said, so what we're going to do then, if you all accept it, is that we're going to bury this mass of tissue in a mass grave as one individual so that it, it's, it's recognised, you know, this is what's left. And the families went, yeah, OK, we get it, that's all right. But there can't be a single cell that belongs to the bombers because we won't have it. And that meant they didn't understand. So that they, we thought they'd got there of understanding the problems of contamination, the problems of transfer, but they'd watched CSI and they knew that you could get DNA out of a single cell. Now, if you, if you were to analyse every single cell, then first of all, you couldn't afford the bill. Secondly, it would take hundreds of years to do. And as you analyse every cell, you destroy it. So there's nothing for you to bury when you find, oh, that cell did belong to your son, but it's gone now because we've had to destroy it, to test it, to find out what it is. But that concept that they had, that DNA can solve everything, that all you need is a single cell, will allow you to, to remove all the bits that are the bombers and just leave these behind. And we realised that we didn't get that across to them. So that fake misconception, that myth about DNA, is so deeply embedded in their understanding and belief that the scientist really struggles to get across what are the problems of why we can't do this. Our technology doesn't allow us, our finance doesn't allow us, and the sheer logistics of what you destroy in the process doesn't allow it. And there, there's sometimes where the conflict occurs in our field. It's usually with the understanding of families or the understanding of the jury.